didn't come on. All right, we'll go ahead and get started at 7 o'clock. I will need to bring me a reminder when it's 8 o'clock because my TV back there is not working. So The confidence monitor, as it's called, is not displaying much confidence. Let's start with prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you uh, for all that you have done for us, all that you continue to do. Once again, we ask as we seek to uh, commune with you, build our relationship with you, uh, cultivate intimacy with you, and doing that primarily through prayer, I just pray, Lord God, that you will be our guide and help us uh, not only to, to hear and to listen and to understand, but also help us to apply because it does very little for, we, for us to hear the word if we do not become doers and if we do not actually put into practice what we say we believe. And I pray that you will be our guide in Christ's name. Amen. All right, we ended last week talking about the three basic steps of contemplative prayer. And we concluded that we, we talked about recollection. And then we will tonight we will talk about the prayer of quiet. Uh, but before I get into that, uh, after church, April had a question that I thought might be relative to uh, others, just asking about Satan uh, and communication with the mind, that she had heard people talk about that Satan could not com communicate with us or to interject thoughts. Now, and the, 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 the exact term I think you used was control. Now, I wouldn't say that Satan can control our thoughts, okay, because only we can control our thoughts. God does not control our thoughts. But Satan can interact with our thoughts and interject uh, thoughts into our mind. This is what we call temptation. But you will hear preachers sometime preach that, oh, that you should quite pray quietly or in your mind because Satan can't hear your thoughts and cannot read your mind and things like that. And then even the... The, the justification for it being that he is a created being. But I don't even see how that would even be a justification in the fact that he could not communicate with us through our mind. I mean, a majority of spiritual warfare takes place in the mind. And so, uh, and I hope some of the thoughts that pop into my head don't come from me. Uh, and, you know, it, it's, a, it's a thing that, uh, and so I would like to open that up for, for discussion if that is something that you have struggled with, wonder about, uh, or whatever. But in my opinion, Satan can definitely uh, tell what we're thinking and interact with what we're thinking. And he definitely can interject thought. Because if he cannot interject thought, then temptation is eliminated. And so we can't be tempted. Because temptation starts, all temptation starts as a thought. And so... Uh, if anybody wants to find clarification, sure. Well, I mean, uh, for those who are online, Betty is asking about the whole thing of the Satanic Temple and that it's considered just another religious movement. Well, why I do not want the existence of the satanic temple, is it any different than a Hindu temple? A Hindu temple. Is it any different than a mosque? All of those are derivatives of demonic activity. I mean, the Apostle Paul says that idolatry is just demonic. You know, of course, they're just pieces of wood or stone, but they represent a demon. Now, when it comes to the whole thing, I mean, because a lot of the stuff I'm seeing is on Facebook. I'm not necessarily finding a lot of stuff other places, and I don't trust social media for my, my information. But it's a thing of, uh, the thing that we have to realize as American, as, as Christians who are American, Christians should come first, as Christians who are American, is I think we've lived under the, the mirage that we were the majority. And while a majority of people would say they believe in God, and maybe even a majority say, in reality, we know, we, hopefully we're aware that that is not, never, that's not, not the case. And so it's a thing that 
uh, it should never surprise us of what is happening in the sense of the negativity and in some ways the reputative persecution that we as Christians are starting to face and will probably face in a greater amount in the future. This should not surprise us. Satan hates us, okay? And uh, he will use whatever he has at his disposal to put persecution upon us. And, uh, and so that we don't, we don't even need to be shocked by it, that, you know, some of the things that we're seeing. I know we, we're shocked because we've, we've, been li- we've lived in a place for so long that we did not, uh, it's, it, it's, such, it's such a change. I mean, of course, for, for Carrie and I, we've lived in places that, you know, where Christians are by far the minority. We're always persecuted. We're always, we were always uh, uh, discriminated against and those kind of things, and, and Christians just live with it. Uh, and, and in some ways, they embrace it as part of the suffering that we are to endure for Christ. But as you see uh, our nation become more and more and more hostile to Christianity, you're going to see them turn towards other faiths. And pluralism, which means multiple religions and all those kind of things, uh, they have their influence. And uh, Hinduism, like, you know, like I've mentioned before, pervades our nation. It is everywhere. Uh, I have even heard things stated within the church that were not based in Christian theology, but based in Hinduism. Uh, I'll tell you one of them. Speak it into existence. That's Hinduistic thought. Okay? Speak it into existence. That's, that's Hinduistic thought. And so, uh, and, and, and you, th- you think about even terms that have become so ordinary to us now, like karma. A, a word that 25 years ago, I guarantee you, none of you would have ever even heard of or used. You know, karma, what is that? Now it is just a normal word that people use all the time. And we have to be really, really a- aware of what's happening around us, not because we're going to become violent against it, not so we can point our finger and tell them all, they're all going to hell, but that we can be aware of its influence upon us because we as the church are being influenced negatively by our culture and by, the, by the, our nation around us, and we have to be aware of that. Because, and, you know, again, you know, from what we talk about in the Revelation class, this is the warnings that John was giving the seven churches of Asia Minor, that you cannot give in to the compromises of your culture. And, uh, and I think, you know, and we talked a little bit about this before with, you know, like things like, you know, the, the legalism of the early Pentecostal movement, but it's a thing of, I mean, maybe we talked about that in Sunday school, but it's a thing of we need to be aware that while we have to keep a foot in the world and a foot in, you know, in order to be a witness, that we cannot allow the world to negatively influence us. And as Christians, when we see things like that's happening all around us and uh, a decline of morality, a decline of ethics, uh, I mean, I mean like to, a, a, as an academic, this whole thing with the, the, the president of Harvard <laughs> plagiarism I couldn't even use two to be verbs in my thesis and she's getting to plagiarize her thesis and you know, it kind of irritates me quite a bit as someone who holds a doctorate uh, but it, you know it's just a thing of uh, you know as we see all these things happening we don't need to oh me and oh my we need to be praying we need to be aware that it doesn't influence us and then we also need to be aware the time is short. And if we truly believe the time is short, wouldn't it change how we live our lives? Uh, yes, I hope to see one day my daughters graduate from college and get their bachelor's and their master's and all this kind of stuff. I hope to one day when my kids, you know, girls are married at 60 and they have their kids that I become a grandparent at 120. I, I mean, I look forward to those times. But I would rather Jesus just come back tonight and not worry about it. Uh, and I'm not so sure a majority of people in the church, and I don't mean this church, I mean nationwide church, would rather see Jesus come back tonight. I think it's too many people are a little bit too comfortable down here on earth. 
And I think I give God's sovereignty a lot of credit. Maybe he's allowing these things to happen to wake us up. Because the church in America has been asleep for far too long. And it's time that we wake up and become the church that God wants us to be. I don't think, I don't think it's a lost cause. If I, was, if I thought it was a lost cause, I would not have returned to America. Uh, now, I will say this. No church has begun a decline like we have throughout Christian history and recovered. The church in Europe is almost gone. The church in Asia Minor is gone. And, uh, however... If the church would wake up, I do believe everything could change. And not that we're trying to, we're not trying to save the nation. We're trying to promote the kingdom. And that the kingdom of God has to become our priority, not only in our life and in everything. Uh, but, and if it would, we would probably be, uh, we'd be amazed at what God would do if we would simply put God first. And I don't know if we're actually doing that or not. But anyway, that's way off my topic. But anyway, so we'll talk about the prayer of quiet along with recollecting. Remember, we're recollecting our life. We're putting Jesus in the center, center as part of this prayer of abandonment. The prayer of quiet, this is the second step. This is after we have removed all distractions. We have recollected our lives and we have placed Jesus in the center of our life. Then we will find ourselves in God's presence in ways maybe we have never experienced before. Now, I think, I hope, most people in, in this room have this feeling there is more to Christianity and much more to God than I personally have experienced. And if you don't think that, then there's a problem in your soul, okay? Because, again, I, I, I don't remember when I mentioned this, God is infinite. We are finite. We can only understand him to a degree. And if we think that we know everything about Scripture, everything about God, then we are foolish. I mean, we are absolutely fools. Because, and we're also incredibly arrogant to think that we know everything about God and that we've gone as far as we need to go into an infinite, a relationship with an infinite God. And so... Uh, we need to continue that, to continue to pursue. I mean, one of the amazing things about salvation is before salvation, God is pursuing you. After salvation, you pursue him. Okay? And our life is a pursuit to know God more, to know God better. And if we will continue to do this, we will eventually find ourselves in his presence in ways maybe we've never experienced, where his grace and his love will surround us. Uh, we will experience or can experience an attentiveness to the movement of the Spirit, a stillness, a silence like we've never experienced before. Uh, we could feel more alive, more aware, more at peace than we could ever describe or ever even understand. Uh, when we enter the, the, the contemplative prayer, something inside of us is awakened. And we have become truly aware of God's presence with us. Uh, we are alert and we are listening, ready to behold and, and, and obey whatever the Lord says. We listen with the mind, we listen with the heart, the spirit, the entire soul, the entire being is listening for the voice of God. Uh, and as we wait, we become, by his grace, more teachable. Now, one of the things that I, 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 I worry about uh, within the body of Christ is our teachability. Are we teachable? Or do we think, we've gone far enough. I don't have anything else to learn. I know as much about God, as much about Bible, either as I want to know or I need to know, and both of those are badly wrong. Uh, again, we're, we're finite. He is infinite. And we need to uh, realize that we need to stay teachable. Age is not a age, whether in years that we've been a Christian or years of our biological life, are never a justification for us to become unteachable. When we stop learning, we start dying. And we have to continue, continue to learn and uh, be teachable. When we enter this state, we will no longer resist correction. And we will no longer resist instruction. 
we are willing to be obedient and uh, follow God in whatever he wants to do. This listening prayer, uh, attentiveness to anything that God would say, willing to obey anything that God would ask of us. And, I mean, again, I, I, I don't ever want us to compare each other. That's, that's a horrible thing, horrible, horrible thing to do, comparing your spirituality, if you want to use that word. I, I don't like that word, but, you know, with someone else, your walk with God with someone else or how far you are down the path. And don't, don't ever feel inferior or less of a Christian because you're not as far along as either someone else or as you would like to be. I hope every one of us realizes that we should be further along than we are. Uh, and that, that the lack of our progress is our own fault, uh, certainly not the fault of God or the Holy Spirit. And, but, you know, questions that we can ask ourselves. Could God today, could God ask me to do anything? And I would say yes. And that is the place, that is our goal. That is the place that we're seeking to be at. Now, if you're not there, if you're not there, that's okay. We're progressing, and coming to that point isn't a matter of just mere choice. Now, it is a matter of will, again, that we put up the sails, we participate with the Holy Spirit through the abiding process, and he brings us to that point. That faith is brought about in us. That faith is a gift from God. It is not something that we work up and make happen. It is a gift from him. But that gift is given as we abide and as we make space, room, raise the sails, whatever metaphor you want to use, for the Holy Spirit to come into our life and transform us to that point. And so if, you're, you know, if, 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 if today you can't pray, God, you could say, you could ask me to do anything and I would do it. If you can't say that, it's all right. Don't, don't feel inferior. Don't feel guilty. Just realize, okay, this is, I still need to pursue God. I still need to grow. I still need to mature. And you know, the thing about it is, is you think, I'm because I, I, I've asked this question many, many times in my seminary class and classes. You know, would you die for Jesus? And everybody raises their hand and woohoo! You know, students are stupid. You know, and uh, and then I ask them, then why won't you change for Jesus? You know, dying for Jesus, but then changing for Him, because that's really what He's asking all of us to do: is to change, to become who He wants us to be who he created us to be, and, but would you do anything? And let me, <laughs> uh, but, you know, it's easy to say yes when you think, oh, yes, I would go across the street and witness to my neighbor. Would you go across the world? Think about, is there anything that God could ask you to do that makes you quench and kind of, I wouldn't want to do that. I know Cheryl is probably eat a lot of the stuff that I've eaten, <laughs> but, Think about it. And if you can think of anything that you say, well, I wouldn't want God to ask me to do that, then we still know we have progress. Okay? What if he asked, you what, he asked Abraham to take your only child and drive a knife through his heart? Now, God asked Abraham to do it. Now, we do know the end of the story, but I don't believe Abraham knew the end of the story when he was asked to do it. I do believe there was a struggle. Why? Because then it wouldn't have been a test if there wasn't a struggle. Okay? If, he, if Abraham was like, oh, sure, I'll go, kill, you know, I'll go kill him, no big deal. It would not have been a struggle for him. Okay, now the third thing that we're a step in this, and I'm sorry for the words, I couldn't think of any other way to put it, spiritual ecstasy. Okay? Uh, this is nothing that we do, and we're talking about ecstatic spiritual experiences. Okay? This is nothing that we do, but something that God does in us. We, again, we cannot work this up, all right? We simply maintain an openness and receptiveness to the Holy Spirit and let God do what he desires, whatever that is, okay? I believe this is what the Apostle Paul is describing in 2 Corinthians when he talks about his experience in third person of being called up to the third heaven. I believe Paul was experiencing contemplative prayer in which he experienced this incredible thing of being called up. He don't even know if, he don't even know if it was in spirit or in the flesh to the third heaven. Uh, 
Others in church history have expressed things that are beyond understanding and beyond belief. Uh, They've expressed incredible, unspeakable, undescribable joy, peace, and sweetness that could not have possibly been sought out, that God just allowed them to experience it. But we have to remember that people who have experienced, and if you read church history, you'll you'll read these in, in, in people like Augustine, Uh, and other people, but it's a thing of when you read about them, the one thing that stands out, they weren't seeking an experience. They were seeking God. If we go into this stuff saying, oh yeah, I want to go to the third heaven, don't ever expect some kind of incredible experience. If you're seeking the experience, you miss the point. You're not even praying contemplatively. You have to seek God, and who cares what you experience? Who cares if you get called up to the third heaven or not? It, God is the goal. God is the purpose. And I think we have to be very careful, especially as Pentecostals, to focus on the experience. Okay? And we've been very guilty of this. Even in our stress of the Holy Spirit, we've been very, very guilty of stressing a specific gift or a specific experience instead of stressing the third person, God, the Holy Spirit in our teaching, in our theology, and even in our pursuits, okay? When we pursue God, we pursue God for God, not anything that God would give as as part of that seeking experience, okay? And the people in history who have experienced some of these extraordinary things, they weren't seeking them. They were just seeking God, and then for some reason, God allowed them to experience them. In our lives, we may never, ever experience anything the way they do or the way they did. Uh, And if we do, it will not be a regular occurrence. It might be once or twice in our entire life, okay? Uh, It wasn't like Paul went to the third heaven every Saturday, okay? You know, it it wasn't like just a weekly trip that he took. Uh, But so, now... You know, you might be thinking, well, Vance, this whole thing is a little bit too much, right? Or you may even feel like this is miles away from your personal experience, uh, and you're just trying to make it through this week. Uh, don't be disheartened. All of us fall short of our relationship with God. All of us are in pursuit of a deeper knowing Him, more intimate relationship with Him, day by day, day by day. Okay. Most of us do not ever get past our own distractions and the distractions of this world, and that's okay. okay. Now, that doesn't mean we accept it. It doesn't mean that we don't try to get past them. It doesn't mean that we, we become complacent and lazy uh, and stop pursuing God, but it's a thing of, we hey, we get distracted. Don't beat yourself up because in your prayer time, you're distracted. It's, it's all right. Uh, But hopefully all of us have experienced enough of God to encourage us to continue the pursuit and continue seeking him. So if we continue to seek him, continue to commune with him, that we will go deeper and deeper and deeper. Uh, The one thing that we should also be encouraged about is while we may never experience what Paul and other people in the Christian faith have, we are comforted that as we draw closer to Christ... Uh, there will be times that we will be able to communicate with God and not speak at all. To, 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 to pray without words. Uh, that our hearts and God's heart can be connected in such a way that we pray without saying a single word. And uh, this is the goal of contemplative prayer. All right, so my example of something that we can pray for in pursuit of knowing God like this. Again, you know, I want to stress over and over and over again, it's not about experiences, it's about God. Dear Heavenly Father and Savior Jesus Christ, listening is very difficult for me. My life in this world, should be our, are so distracting and my life is so fragmented and fractured. But I know that it is not about my trying harder, but simply learning to receive. This is about being more than doing. Please help me and enable me to be able to listen. I want to be closer to you. I want to know you more. I want to be aware of your presence and to swim in your depths. 
I want to live and truly abide in you. Please help me to do this. Pull me in. Amen. All right. Well, I, mean, I don't think you can, like, divide. I'm oh, sorry. For those online, the opinion was asking, what's the difference between the spiritual ecstasy and God's grace? Well, and it's not about a line. It's a thing of any experience, supernatural experience that we might have are still gifts of God's grace. Uh, this, you know, this is why this, this particular type of prayer I almost skipped because it is so hard to explain. Uh, visions, certain visions could be equated as a spiritual experience in which in God's grace, for some reason or another, he shows us something uh, that we don't normally experience. Or a level of joy or peace uh, in our seeking him that is above the average peace and thing. But it will all be anything, any, any, of the, any kind of supernatural experience that we might have will be a gift of his grace. Uh, so I don't think you could, you could separate grace from that. But it's a thing of why does God, okay, why did God take Paul to the third heaven and not me? Uh, I don't know. Now let me just say this. The third heaven is actually where God dwells. That's, it's not like there's levels of reward. Okay, Heaven right here. It just means sky. It means air, okay? And then when you talk about the third heaven, that is, that's, that is where God dwells, okay? Uh, where his throne would be, if you will, what John saw in Revelation. Uh, but to, to, I mean, like the thing that, I, I, read, I read an account of Augustine where he experienced just an incredible feeling of being loved, uh, of grace, and to where I think for a, for a significant period of time, he didn't even know anything, didn't even realize anything around him, that he was, he was in such a thick pre presence of God's presence, he didn't realize anything around him. And that's very similar to things that I, I've read from Moody and Wesley and other people who've experienced some things like this. I would think that your average Christian probably never experiences this, simply because we don't spend the time to go that deep. Uh, or the pursuit. I mean, I, I, again, it's not, it's not a thing of, re, of rewarding you, oh, because you spent longer time in prayer. Uh, why God chooses to allow one person to experience something incredible like that and not another person. But I won't put God in a box to say, for any of us, that hey, we can't. Now, I know a lot of people who like to put God in boxes and say, oh, those things don't happen anymore. Oh, that's not of God, and that's not, that's not real. We've got to be careful. Now, that we do have a Bible, and we can be discerning, and we can be, you know, uh, I mean, I don't like the whole thing of people clucking like chickens and barking like dogs, and, you know, uh, you're not going to get me to buy into that kind of stuff. Uh, but there are things that I have experienced in my relationship with God that I cannot explain. I cannot explain. Uh, now, can I say I've achieved contemplated prayer? I don't know. I can say I've experienced things I can't explain. However, I don't know if I've experienced this or not. Uh, and I don't know if, I mean, I guess you'd know if you'd call it in the third heaven. Wow, okay, then I experienced something big. Uh, I have had a vision uh, once in my life. Uh, and then in other situations where uh, I lose awareness of my surroundings because of the presence of God, uh, I've experienced that, but I don't know if that's what I'm talking about. I mean, that, that's, that's why this is so difficult, and I really almost and maybe should have uh, skipped this section, but uh, I wanted to present it as something that, to know no matter how far you've gone, you can keep going. You can go deeper. I don't care if you've been a Christian 120 years. You can still know him better. You can still know him more. And... In my abiding time this morning, I, I was asking God very specific questions before I went into the Word, and then uh, I am reading the Bible systematically and 
not at any particular speed. I, I, I don't try to finish the Bible in a year, or stuff like that. I don't, I don't get into that kind of stuff. I mean, you can, that's fine. I'm not just, you know, saying it's wrong. I just don't do it. And one thing that I noticed uh, today in the Word was how everybody missed Jesus. Everybody. Okay, the Pharisees completely missed that he was the Messiah because they were jealous of him. Okay, he was getting all the glory. Everybody was patting Jesus on the back. Everybody was following Jesus. And over and over and over again, the Gospels tell us they were envious, that they wanted to kill him because they were jealous and envious. Okay, the disciples completely missed Jesus. Over and over and over again, he told them, hey, I'm going to die. And three days later, I'm going to resurrect. Okay. And he died, and they're like, oh, it's over. And even when people were coming back and testifying, he's risen, he's risen, the Bible says they didn't believe. Okay? And that part hit me as far as people, <laughs> you know, in, in the sense of uh, as a pastor, sometimes wondering are, when I'm preaching and my teaching, are people getting it? Is it getting, is it getting into their heart? Is it getting past the, you know, the, and, I, and, and that's what, illuminated this in, in, in my study was, okay, Jesus, obviously, was the greatest preacher who ever lived or ever will live, okay? He was brilliant. I mean, when you're reading the Gospels, his answers and stuff, I mean, you, you know, you, you talk about several times that the Pharisees, they were just speechless. They were so amazed at the thing, that the answers he would come up with and how, you know, great of a teacher and how he taught with authority and all these kind of things, and <laughs> the disciples didn't get it. I mean, the most br the word made flesh, preaching the gospel, and they didn't get it. But why didn't they get it? Because they had preconceived notions of what the Messiah was supposed to be, what they had been taught before. And it's made me wonder, in the church, have we heard stuff so many times in our life, same sermon, same stuff, same theology, sometimes it's wrong, and we're unwilling to look at the scripture and look at to see if what we've heard all of our life is wrong. And so we just dismiss it as it's not right. And so, and I think the answer to that question is that's exactly what we do. We, have, we come to the Bible with preconceived cultural notions and even theological notions. And we don't read the text for what it says. And what it said then and what it says now. And... And then, you know, so then my question to, in my abiding time, because I ask God questions, I'm like, well, then what can I do about it? What can I do about it if I'm preaching something and it ain't getting past people's preconceived notions or stuff they've heard their whole life? <laughs> and Jesus' answer was, nothing. <laughs> That's not your job. That's the Holy Spirit's job. Okay, and then you know, I read about three chapters in the, in the, at the end of the Gospel of Mark. Okay, so Jesus, they're not, nobody's getting it. Nobody's getting it. He's over in the corner in the Garden of Gethsemane, sweating blood, crying out, screaming, you know, if it's possible, let this cup pass for me. Not my will be done, but yours. And he goes over to his friends, and they're asleep. And I think we need to be awakened. And even when he woke them up, hey, pray with me. Walks up, and they go back to sleep. I mean, you had to hear him crying. And then we need, each one of us, God, I want to believe the word. Not what I've heard, not what my grandmother taught me, not what was preached my whole life. I want to know the truth of your word so that I can see you for who you are and live the life you want me to live. Not the expectations of my denomination, not the expectations of my family or my friend. I want to please you and live for you. I want to see you for who you are, not for what I have been taught. I want to, I want to find you in your word. But if we don't read the Bible, we don't study the Bible, that will never happen. But then we also need to include prayer of, Holy Spirit, break my hardened heart. Crush these preconceived notions that I have of you, 
that I have of the Father, that I have of the Son, that I have of the Christian life, that I have of the Word of God, and show me your truth. Because the Holy Spirit, His job is to reveal the truth. And yet, are we not like the disciples? We have Jesus in front of us telling us through His Word, He is the Word made flesh, and yet we'd rather believe something we heard when we were 10 years old. Uh, And I think we have to be... Uh, And I will say this, that when I was praying this, I also felt, through the word, uh, how did the disciples wake up? How did they wake up? They saw him. They saw him. They saw Jesus. They didn't believe when Mary Magdalene came running. They didn't believe when the two guys on the road came running. Hey, he's risen, he's risen. They didn't believe. They believed him when they saw him. So how do we wake up? See him. How do you see Jesus? Through the word. It is the only way. Okay? There's times I want to shake people. There's times I want to scream and holler and cry and weep and uh, pull my hair out, but I don't have any. And, but it's only by seeing Jesus will people wake up and see him for who he truly is. And I pray that God will bring us to that. I know that didn't answer your question at all, but uh, I think the experiences, again, I, I, I don't ever want us to seek the experience. I think if we seek God, let it happen what it will. You know, if I have a vision or a gift or some kind of experience like Paul had or others have had, so that'd be, I mean, it'd be wonderful, of course, But that's not what I want. I want God. Uh, And I think sometimes some of our preaching and and promotion in the Pentecostal church, we promoted something other than God. That we have promoted experience. We have promoted miracles and healings. And all those things are good. And I do believe they happen. Uh, But it's not what we're supposed to be seeking. And I think sometimes, and I've said this many times, I think the reason that we don't see them in the Pentecostal American church is because that's what we're seeking. Uh, And in most places in the world where they are still experiencing those things, that's not what they're seeking. They're seeking God and those things happen. And so I think we need to make sure that we recollect our lives to where God is our pursuit. When you read the Bible, do you read the Bible to know God or to check the list, today I abided, today I am righteous, or today I met with Jesus in his word? And that's why we pray that prayer at the beginning on Sunday morning. And that's the, uh, every time I read the Bible, God, I want to experience you. I want to encounter you. If you want to say something to me, please help me to hear it. If you need to correct me, if you need to guide me, if you need to lift me, please help me to hear you. Help me to know you better through your word. And I did that this morning. I read three chapters and I got spoken to. It wasn't like God pat me on the shoulder or nothing. Through his word, he answered questions that I wrote down before I read it. And you say, well, you knew, what was, you knew what was coming. That's not what I was asking about. And he still showed me. Uh, I, was, I was actually complaining about my own frustrations. And in some ways, then I thought, well, goodness, if they won't listen to you, what hope do I have? <laughs> you know, so, okay, so. prayer upward. So we're going to take a few minutes, and this time I'm not going to turn the cameras off. So those who are watching online, these are the things that we have went through so far. Uh, The one on the bottom, you're not going to be able to do in the time that we have. But we're going to take time to pray upward, and we're going to go through all of them. And I hope what you're doing in your own personal prayer life is as we went through these things, you're actually using them. You're actually praying those types of prayers. You don't have to pray all of them at one setting, but throughout the day you can pray different ones. But if you're still praying simple prayers, then you're never going to grow in your prayer life, and you're never going to be transformed. Okay? But So I want you to take time and give some adoration. What is adoration? Praise and thanksgiving. What is praise? God, you're great. Creator, sustainer, sovereign king, uh, eternal, immutable, or unchangeable. Uh, omniscient, omnipresent, I mean, on and on and on. It's praising God for who he is. Thanksgiving is thanking him for what he has done. Well, what has he done? Uh, it appears to me that all of you are alive. 
Some of you, I might have a couple of doubts, but that was a joke. Uh, but you're saved, right? I'm sure most of you ate today or will when you get home. You arrived here safely. Uh, some of you have a spouse beside you. You can thank God for them. Uh, some of you had a job today. Uh, some of you live in a house. Some of you, and all of us, I hope, had a place to sleep. On and on and on and on. You can thank him forever. And then, uh, shh, and just rest and be quiet. After you praise him and thank him, see if he has anything to say to you and just reflect on him. Reflect on the things you just said above, the praise and the thanksgiving you gave. Uh, and then if you have your Bibles or um, if you have your phones, you can go to the, to the Lord's Prayer, Psalm 23, whatever, or some kind of, you can Google Apostles' Creed and pray through that. And then the breath prayer we talked about before, uh, this is something I hope you've already kind of established. These are prayers that you work out with God. And basically, once you're in his presence where, you ask, where he asks you the question or you permit him to ask you the question, what do you want? What do you want from me? Let God ask you that question. And then answer him. I want peace. God, please give me peace. I want joy. I don't have joy. I want uh, truth. On and on and on. You know, whatever it is for you. Then, again calling him father, developing this intimacy. That requires vulnerability. It requires transparency, honesty. God, I'm not doing so good with this. I'm not praying so much. I don't talk to you very often. And when I do, it's just a wish list. And while I know you, can, you care about my needs, there's much more to a relationship you, with you than that. And I want to develop this intimacy with you. And then meditate. Take, this, take the scripture, maybe even the one that you read in the sacramental prayer, and think about it. Okay? And we're going to do this until time expires. And for those online, I encourage you at home to do it as well. It will even be probably easier for you. You can set where you are or you can move. Uh, but just like we did before, we will uh, we'll do this for the remainder of the time. And then at 8 o'clock, I will come and close in a prayer, and, and then we will depart. Uh, I do want to say that next week, again, we will have class next week, and we will start movement outward. So we've went inward, upward, and then now we will go outward. And this is what we're talking about is praying for others. Okay? So disperse. I mean, spread out.
Father, Lord, we praise you and exalt you and magnify you and adore you. For you are worthy of all praise. You are the sovereign ruler of the universe, the eternal God, the one who never changes, perfect in all your ways. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of your glory. We praise you and exalt you for all that you are, for you are worthy of our praise. You are the creator of all things, the sustainer of all things, the giver of all good things. There is no darkness in you at all, only light. And you are marvelous and mighty, able to do all that we ask, all of our needs. Lord God, your, your, your love is beyond description. So many things, Lord God, that describe who you are. So many of your attributes that we can't even begin to fathom. You are the infinite God in who there is no limit. There is none like you. And we worship your name and we thank you. We thank you for, for, for creating us. We thank you for the plan of our redemption and for sending your son into this world to obtain our redemption. We thank you, Holy Spirit, for applying uh, what Jesus did for us into our lives and how you're helping us and, and nurturing us and ur urging us and pushing us to grow and to develop and to mature. We thank you, Lord God, for all that you provide, the food that we have, our families, both our biological family and our church family, Lord. We thank you. We thank you for bringing us to this place, for giving us the opportunity to hear your word and to obey and to draw closer to you. There are so many people in the world who have never heard uh, the name of Jesus. So many people in the world that don't have the privilege that we have tonight to gather safely in this building. There are many of our brothers and sisters around the world who gather in dark rooms and, 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 and do so very quietly in fear of persecution or fear of being arrested or even worse. And we thank you that we have this privilege. I pray that we never take for granted all that you have given us, all that you provided. You chose the nation in which we were to be born, and we thank you that you allowed us to be born here where we could at least have the ability to hear the gospel of Christ and have the freedom to worship you and to call upon your name and, and not to have to do so in secret. And even as our country changes, God, we thank you that greater is he that is in us than he that is in this world and that we have nothing to fear. And that even in the midst of our trials and our tribulations and our difficulties, that we can, have, we can rejoice because we know the big picture. We know that you are the sovereign God of the universe who is in control of all things. That nothing surprises you. That nothing happens by, you know, by chance or that you, you, you're aware of all of it. You either, uh, you, that you control everything and that you will bring about the end. You will bring about justice. You will set all things right. You hold our future in, our, in, in your hand. It is not something you know, uh, that, that, that is outside of your, your peripheral. And you see the big things and the little things in our life. And you care about those things. That you love us so much. That you never sleep and you never slumber. Your eyes are always upon us. And we thank you and we worship you for that. And Lord, we pray. Psalm 23. The Lord is our shepherd and we lack nothing. You make us lie down in green pastures. You lead us beside quiet waters. You refresh our soul. You guide us along the right paths for your namesake. And even though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we will fear no evil, for you are with us. Your rod and your staff, they comfort us. You prepared a table before us in the presence of our enemies. You anoint our head with oil. Our cup overflows. And surely... Your goodness and love will follow us all the days of our life, and we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Lord, we thank you for being our shepherd. We thank you, Lord God, and we pray our breath prayer, Lord God, that whatever that may be for each individual person, for me, I just pray I want to be assured that I am in your will that I'm in your will as, as a husband, that I'm in your will as a father, that I'm in your will as a pastor, and that I'm in your will as a, as, as a human being, as a man. And I just pray, Lord God, that while I can find your general will for my life in the Scriptures, for your, your will for all of our lives in the Scriptures, I pray, Lord God, that you will give me the assurance of your specific will for my life, that I'm doing what you want, where you want, how you want, with a, the heart and attitude and motivation that you want. And I pray, Lord God, that I, I, I will fulfill your will and that you will assure me of your will. And Lord God, we pray to be closer to you, 
each and every day, that we will never grow tired of seeking you, to know you more and to know you better, to be able to call you with all sincerity, Abba, Father, Daddy, and that we can do this not just in times of, tribu- you know, of, of, of celebration, not just in times of, you know, of great worship, but in times of suffering, like in Romans chapter 8, that when our whole world has fallen apart, we can cry out to you, Daddy, we need you. And I just pray, Lord God, that we will realize this. And I pray as we go home and as we drive and as we have times laying in bed in the morning or laying in bed at night or or times of inactivity and silence throughout the day that we'll be able to ruminate on your word, to think about and be aware of your presence and that our mind, our heart, our soul, our spirit, our strength, all will be set upon you. And Lord God, we thank you as we've asked you to to move within us, and now we've moved towards you in worship. I pray next week as we begin to learn more and more how to pray for other people, how to move outward in prayer, that you will be our guide and that you will guide us into all truth. I pray, Lord God, that you will crush pride within us that thinks that we are we have arrived in some way, that we we've gone far enough or that we know enough or that we know you good enough and that you will help us to see that we have only just begun. And there's so much further, so much deeper, because you are infinite. There is no limits. There is no, there's no, there, there is no amount of depth. There is nothing that we cannot, that we can never know you enough. And I just pray that we will not grow weary in our pursuit of you. And that each and every day, each one of us, individually and as a church, will know you better. And we pray all these things in your glorious name. Amen. Amen. You're dismissed.